So good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here um, so bright and early. And um, I hope you enjoyed some time together last night. Uh, today, we change gears. Yesterday, we were talking about survivors and solutions. And today, we're still talking about solutions, but we're talking about the other part of the equation. We're talking about the individuals who have committed violence against other people because of who they are. And the reason we're gonna spend so much time on this today, although it's very difficult and a lot of what you'll see and hear is very difficult, it's worth spending time on because we don't know how to solve that problem if we can't see that problem and if we don't deeply understand it. So today we're going to, to try to share some panels to help you understand that part of the equation. And uh, we are very lucky to be joined today by Tom Woods, some of you may have met him here last year. He is uh, the prosecutor of the landmark Adam Waffen case, and he's gonna lead us off this morning. Tom. Thank you. So we're gonna talk this morning about Adam Waffen. Adam Waffen was, is a neo-Nazi, white supremacist, violent extremist organization. You know, they had branches both in the United States and in Europe, and were responsible for violence, including murder. One of the things that is unfortunate about Adam Waffen is they were very good at marketing, very good at attracting young, disaffected individuals with videos that, like this that we're about to see. So if we could queue up, please, my first video. So Adam Waffen came to my attention because of Caleb Cole. And if we could put on the screen my first slide, and you'll see Caleb Cole is the individual on the left. In the lead up of the, to the pandemic in 2019 and 2020, Caleb Cole was one of the leaders of Adam Waffen, responsible for that video you just saw and organizing the publicity for the group and he was in the Seattle area. He was of tremendous concern to law enforcement because of his repeated statements about wanting to carry out violence. One of the creeds of Adam Waffen was the idea that there would be some sort of a race war 
that would start, that would spark the downfall of the U.S. government. And so law enforcement really targeted Caleb Cole. And if we can go to my next slide, please. One of the things that was really scary about him was he had a huge arsenal of weapons. And what happened is the Seattle Police Department working with the FBI and our local prosecutor's office took advantage of what was then one of the first and pioneering red flag laws in the United States that Washington has enacted. A civil remedy that prosecutors can use to take firearms away from someone who is deemed to be a risk of creating harm to others. And that's what we did in this case, which is we got an order from a state judge seizing Cole's arsenal of weapons. Now I need to pause the story for a moment here to say that law enforcement will get and does get a lot of the credit for dismantling this organization. And I'm happy to take that credit. But really the true heroes of this story, the folks that made actually the most difference were journalists. You know, and I'd call out in particular ProPublica and then one of our local news reporters, Chris Ingalls, with a Fox affiliate in Seattle. And ProPublica, Chris, and others did a lot of groundbreaking reporting about this group. This group tried to shroud themselves in anonymity. So they used monikers, they used nicknames when they were communicating with others to keep their real identity secret. And ProPublica and Chris did a lot of reporting to unmask who was actually part of this group. And Chris in particular did a lot of reporting about the guns that were seized from Caleb Cole. And this reporting made Adam Waffen nervous and it made them mad. And that's what launched uh, what the next operation. If you could look at the next slide, please. And the next one. So what you're seeing here on the screen, and it's a little blurry because of the way it was captured uh, in real time, was an operation that was launched by Adam Waffen to target members of the media, to instill fear, to try to intimidate them from reporting on their activities. And this group organized in secret encrypted chats online they had the misfortune of including someone who turned out to be in a government informant, which is why you're seeing uh, some of these chats on the screen. And if we could go to the next slide, you'll see in their own words their efforts to try to intimidate journalists by postering their homes and by sending posters in the mail designed to intimidate them from further um, reporting on Adam Waffen. And if we go to the next slide. And in a series of encrypted chats, there were efforts by Adam Waffen members throughout the United States to target journalists, activists, folks who were involved in this space to identify as many people as they could to target with these threatening posters. As you can imagine, this caused us a great deal of concern. What was gonna happen here? Were there gonna be acts of violence? What would happen when folks showed up at these individuals' homes and postered their, um, their homes? Was there gonna be acts of violence? What was gonna happen? And so we tried as law enforcement, as best as we could, to figure out who were the specific people who are gonna be targeted. And if we go to the next slide. And that culminated in having this informant and introducing an undercover agent to visit Caleb Cole in person. And true to his very core, his very nature, that's him right there. That's how he answered the door when the informant showed up. And in a series in this meetings at his house, that we tried as much as we can to identify who these potential victims might be so we could warn them and keep them safe. 
On the night of the operation in late January, several victims were in fact targeted. If we go to the next slide, and the next one. And you'll see here's one of the posters that uh, two of the victims received. There's a man in a skull mask holding a Molotov cocktail in front of a burning house. That specific poster was sent to uh, a woman who is the editor of a Jewish publication. And it's a little hard to see, but that poster is taped to a glass window, and that glass window was to her daughter's bedroom window. So she woke up that morning, no idea what, that it was going to be a different day than any other, walked out and saw that poster taped to her daughter's bedroom window. Next slide. This was another poster that was sent. One was taped to a uh, home of, of someone, and also this was sent uh, in the mail as well. And next slide, please. And this was the poster to Chris Ingalls, that local news reporter that I mentioned. You see here, there's a member of the press with individuals holding guns to that person's head. And you see death to pigs that is written on top. And if we go to the next slide, that was not a mistake or that was not happenstance that that phrasing was on that poster. That is a picture from the crime scene of one of the Charles Manson murders. So a family slaughtered in their home and that phrasing um, was used in, in Chris's poster. As you can imagine, this caused intense terror. You know, a lot of the victims in this case talked about how unsafe they felt in their home. And let's remember when these events occurred, right in the middle of the pandemic, right when everyone was being told to shelter in place in their home, people were being intimidated. And you saw in those posters that every poster was accompanied with the name of the victim and their home address, making clear that they knew where they lived. And the impact really was tremendous on these victims. And, and I think Chris um, probably said it best. And if we could cue up Chris, the Chris Ingalls video. The threat against King Five's Chris Ingalls comes after months of exposing Adam Waffen's operation in the United States. So here's Chris's personal story of what he's been living through and how he and his family responded. I was told that trouble could be coming right to my doorstep. Excellent. You can see on my security camera, it was a Saturday night, and I walk out and I meet a Seattle police detective who's assigned to the Joint Terrorism Task Force. And his job on this particular Saturday night was to watch over my house. Here's why he was out there. A couple days just before that, I got a call to come into the United States Attorney's Office, and two FBI agents were there and they told me that they thought that Adam Waffen could be coming to my house. They didn't have a lot of information. They said they didn't necessarily expect violence, but they couldn't tell me exactly what this group planned to do at my house. They just thought they knew where I lived and they were coming. We're at our house and we're just kind of thinking to ourselves, you know, why would we stay here? We didn't waste any time. We had the kids pack their bare essentials into a bag and throw it into the trunk of the car. And we went and we stayed in a motel for several nights. Just wondering if you could put into words that initial feeling when I called you. Um, I just wanted to grab the kids and take them home. And then I realized home is the one place where we shouldn't be. We also had a 24-7 security team that followed us wherever we went. For instance, if one of the kids came home to get their clothes or pick something up, oh, good. one of those security guards went with them. The FBI's been outside now for, well, I guess, more than three hours, and there's just nothing going on. The FBI warned me that just because Adam Waffen was a no-show on one particular night, it didn't mean that this whole thing was over. It's a couple days later now. It's, um, 
it's actually Wednesday night and I have just noticed something in my mailbox that doesn't look quite right. There's a letter in there that has a, a label on it, a typed label that's been taped onto the envelope. Looks suspicious to me. I didn't open the letter. I brought it to the FBI office and agents opened it and they showed it to me. I did take that letter as a threat. You know, it's covered in swastikas. It shows a phony reporter. It says, you've been visited by your local Nazis. One thing you have to know about Adam Waffen is they're not just Nazis. They have this insane belief that Charles Manson was onto something. This is a 1960s mass murderer who killed innocent people to try to start a race war. They would write death to pigs on the wall and their victim's blood at their crime scenes. And the letter to me says death to pigs. They're saying we have your home address and we idolize a man who slaughtered people in their homes. All right. Before we continue the, the story of the trial, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about the background of Adam Waffen and what it is. And Jessica, you've done a lot of work on that. Could you continue the story for us? Yes. <clears throat> Good morning. My name is Jessica Cran. I'm a, a freelance producer and director. Um, and uh, I'm going to be speaking to you about the early days of Adam Waffen, the original founders and members. Um, sadly, I have not been as diligent as Tom with my visuals and slides. I have, however, prepared a very loquacious speech, so mm -hmm. hopefully that will make up for it. Um, from its inception in 1983, the internet heralded the dawn of a new age, an age of information and access, expedience and efficiency, of innovation and inclusion. Together we could better communicate, exchange knowledge, even organize an action pro-democratic rebellion, and it changed the face of how we conduct business, how we date, and how we socially interact. A host of unprecedented changes were ushered in, but when a culture struggles to keep pace with the rapid and seismic shifts that industrial revolution brings, it can birth all kinds of unintended social consequences. In the age of the internet, this includes information, misinformation, I'm sorry, alienation, and even radicalization. In January of this year, I was asked to produce a documentary series for Vice News with a focus on present-day US criminal gangs and terror cells. Of all the groups we spotlighted, it was the fundamentalist white boys who most intrigued me. For in this post-9-11, post-neoliberal, post-Trumpian era, it's they who continue to loom ever large in our headlines, our conscience, and our digital landscape. White supremacist activity is considered by many to be the greatest threat to both our democracy and national security. I've spoken with anthropologists, academics, NGO leaders, and policymakers alike who all speak of the deluge of hate groups and sites popping up on the web daily and of their swelling youth membership. Many white boys, my own nephew included, he's 11 by the way, are beginning to articulate a collective existential crisis or a palpable anger and a sense of injustice, I think, in the wake of movements like Me Too and Black Lives Matter. I think there's a feeling that they're being overlooked, left out, forced to bear an unfair burden of a new bias against the Caucasian male. And as such, it seems like anyone can get caught up in, in this vortex of hate. Um, and I was particularly disturbed and intrigued by the young men from ostensibly normal backgrounds being drawn to neo-Nazi thought. Millennials and Gen Z, after all, are the largest religiously unaffiliated, politically independent, and ethnically diverse generations in history. It was our grandparents who fought fascism and won. Never again is what we were taught in school while learning about the Holocaust. So what prompts a young man in this day and age to turn to extremist groups that espouse outdated notions of homophobia, racial hatred, and fascist regime. It didn't take many key word search variations of American neo-Nazi youth groups for me to stumble upon Atomwaffen Division. And could we play the, pl the first video, please? Is there someone inside you? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
If I ask him to tell me, will you let him answer? <laughs> Slick production, heavy bass, very powerful visuals. They're all designed to get the heart rate and the adrenaline surging. And these are the stirring yet very cost-effective recruitment videos and messaging that Atomwaffen Division, or AWD, propagates. Their target audience, as Tom mentioned, is misguided, disenfranchised, and disaffected young men who they aim to draw into their terroristic fold by appealing to their fantasies of being a strong man, a hero, or a rebel with a cause. And the message is simple. Modern day society, egalitarianism, and woke politics are inherently impractical, corrupt, and irredeemable. As such, in the Atomwaffen Division members' view, the world is speeding to a violent, bloody collapse that will inevitably end in a battle for supremacy. Their name in itself invokes doom. Atomwaffen is German for nuclear weapons. They embrace the notion of white genocide, promote their belief in a Zionist occupied government, and they extol Hitler's final solution. And as accelerationist Nazis, their only goal is chaos, to undermine the pillars of our society and democracy through a series of ongoing disruptive terror attacks. And by speeding up civilizational collapse, they will foment a rohawa, or holy racial war, neutralize the black and Jewish threat, and emerge from the ashes to build an all-white utopia. AWD is just one of many breakout hate groups that can tra trace its origins to Iron March, an online forum that many people here may have heard of that offered safe space for people to exchange ideas and learn about fundamentalist and fascist thinking. In 2015, a young man named Brandon Clint Russell, who went by the pseudonym of Odin, grew tired of what he viewed as idle chat on the forum and issued a call to arms. We are a fanatic, ideological band of comrades who do both activism and military training. No keyboard warriors, he exclaimed. If you don't want to meet up and get things done, don't bother responding. Russell wanted to action the idea of leaderless resistance, of economical lone wolf terrorism, and build a brand of brothers so committed to the cause that they'd join him in real life combat and tactical training, help him recruit from high schools, college campuses, and even the ranks of active and military servicemen with military prowess and training. As a middle class boy with a nuclear physics degree, Russell was dynamic, not static. He was able to build homemade bombs using the same ingredients as his hero, Timothy McVeigh. He was able to hold down a job, enlist in the National Guard, and effectively tap into the imaginations of other angry boys like him. One of Russell's earliest initiates was a Floridian teenager named Devon Arthurs, a disturbed young man with a documented history of early childhood depression, ADHD, anxiety disorder, and autism spectrum. Targeted by schoolyard bullies and rejected by his peers, Devon spent hours online playing games like World of Warfare and Minecraft, sites that many parents might view as innocuous, but it's on sites like these that vulnerable kids like Devon are groomed, recruited, and gradually steeped in the violent tribalism as touted by the likes of Brandon Russell. Men like Russell will echo, encourage, and legitimize their right-leaning sympathies. They'll redirect them to the fundamentalist sites that strengthen their faith in hateful dogma and outlandish conspiracy. They'll bombard them with shocking visuals and violent motifs until they're numb and immune. And they will offer solace, camaraderie, and a raison d'etre to fill the void of these boys' often lonely and sometimes directionless young lives. The difference between groups like Atomwaffen and other neo-Nazi groups that we've seen throughout US history is that where once such groups could physically congregate, they now use the web to communicate convert, covertly, recruit nationally and globally, spread their insidious message, and reach into the bedrooms of even US middle-class suburbia. It was on the web that two more dejected Massachusetts teenagers stumbled across Russell's, Russell's fledgling militia, 
20-year-old Jeremy Himmelman and 17-year-old Andrew Onershuk. Like Devon Arthurs, Himmelman had a history of depression, anxiety, and suicidal tendency. He had long struggled to find his place in the world, eventually becoming enamored with his German heritage and Nazi doctrine. Andrew Onershuk, like Brandon Russell and Devon Arthurs, came from a stable middle-class home, an impressive and decorated military legacy, and had grown up shielded from extremist politics. But Andrew, too, was depressed, alienated, and diagnosed with defiance disorder. He, had, he too, had suffered the torments of bullies and struggled to forge lasting or meaningful relationships in school until he discovered the other boys online who shared his worldview. Thereafter, he began brandishing Nazi pins, unfurling giant swastika flags, and lashing out at his family, calling them traitors to their race. He spent hours online bonding with members of AWD's Ukrainian sister cell, Azov Battalion, ultimately purchasing a fake passport and ticket to Eastern Europe to train with his extremist brothers in arms. Russell eventually invited the East Coast boys to join him and Devon in Tampa, Florida, and it was here that they would secure an apartment, live together, and further the AWD cause IRL in real life. Um, the boys transformed their gated Floridian apartment into a treasure trove of Nazi memorabilia. Fundamentalist literature like Mein Kampf and the Turner Diaries lined the bookshelves. A framed photo, photo of Timothy McVeigh had pride of place on Devon's living room console. AK-47s and other semi-automatic rifles lay scattered about the rooms, and the garage was stuffed with homemade bomb-making materials. But the boys' youthful testosterone, underdeveloped prefrontal cortexes, and socially, social alienation proved a toxic cocktail. Devon Arthurs continued to grow increasingly paranoid in Andrew and Jeremy's presence. Tensions soared as Devon dived down a new online rabbit hole, Islamic fundamentalism, for which he was certain Jeremy and Andrew were mocking him. Ultimately, in a momentary flash of fury, Devon grabbed one of the rifles and shot his own comrades at close range. At the time, Jeremy Himmelman was 21, while Devon and Andrew were barely 18. Just months later, in Virginia and California, two more AWD, AWD recruits would go on to commit homicide. 16-year-old Nicholas Giampa and 20-year-old Sam Woodward also suffered from childhood depression, bullying, and autism spectrum. After signing up with AWD, Giampa went on to execute his girlfriend's parents while Woodward chose to slay a former Jewish gay classmate before burying him in a shallow grave. So within the first seven months of its formation, Atomwaffen Division had been linked to five murders, all at the hands of the group's adolescent recruits, a testament to their unique and effective brand of indoctrination. What linked all of these misguided young men? In my mind, it was the obvious parallels of depression, anxiety, learning difficulties, and sometimes autism none of which connote or predict violent or fundamentalist behavior, but all of which marked them as different from their peers, set them apart from the modern world, and made them vulnerable to hateful messaging. Almost all had a preoccupation with finding acceptance and a place to call home. Tragically, this was among the ranks of the AWD, but perhaps most tellingly, even AWD's founder, Brandon Russell, suffered from autism, anxiety, and ADHD. In fact, after his arrest in 2017, his own mother lamented that all he'd ever really wanted was to simply belong. I think many are quick to point the finger of blame at the parents of boys like these with accusations like it all starts with the family. Why didn't the families of these radicalized boys do anything to correct and check them? But as Emily Onershuk, Andrew's sister, will tell you, it's incredibly difficult to deflect a loved one from the path of fundamentalism. If we could um, show the photos of Andrew, please. Um, in the case of Andrew Onershuk, his family tried everything. New schools, progressive courses, counseling, and endless patience, only to be scorned and ignored by Andrew. It's Emily who will articulate the pain and anguish of a family forced to stand by, powerless to help or reach their son as he drifted further and further away until eventually his short life was extinguished by futile hatred. In conclusion, we need to find a way to reach young men of today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jess. Um, telling this story is confusing and difficult. Um, I wish it 
I had a, a clearer way to do it. Even after all these years, Andrew died almost six years ago. Um, and every time I speak about it, whether it be publicly or when I get asked the awkward question, do you have siblings on a first date? Um, I never quite know what to say. Um, and so I wanted to start by telling you who he was and who the brother I loved was because that's where this story starts. Um, Andrew was a sensitive kid. He was cute. He had big cheeks and curly blonde hair. And um, I told my parents to send him back to the hospital mm -hmm. when they brought him home. Um, <laughs> the picture you saw of us in our Halloween costumes um, was probably shortly after I bit him for trying to play with my Barbie Dream Hotel. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we had a normal sibling relationship. Um, <laughs> You know, as anyone with uh, an older sister can tell you. So he was, like I said, a sensitive kid. Um, one of my favorite stories about him is the time he tried to call the cops on my dad as a six-year-old um, because my dad wouldn't save a baby bird in the backyard. Um, he was big into his animal phase um, at that point. So things were pretty normal growing up. I'd say we lived an idyllic life. Um, I was very lucky to have two very devoted parents, um, lots of extended family, many opportunities. Um, anything that my parents thought could help us along the way, they provided for us. Um, and that still holds true to this day. Um, things began to change in our house when Andrew was around 11. Um, my dad was deployed to Iraq for a year. He was a uh, naval reservist at the time. He had been a pilot and he had been recalled um, to go over to Balad for a year. Um, if you're in the military currently or living on a military base, you know that that's not unusual um, and you have a big support network. However, when you live in suburban Boston, you uh, end up being very alone. So suddenly mom's single parenting. Um, I am, to put it bluntly, an asshole 15 year old and <laughs> my brother is sad. Um, and he started spending more time on the internet. And I don't know when it started. I don't know what triggered it. Um, but around the age of 11, he started throwing around racial slurs um, that I had never heard in my house or in person anywhere before. Um, I was confused. I was angry. I didn't know what to do. My mom didn't know what to do. And all the normal punishment, go to your room, you know, grounding, nothing worked. Um, and I would say that was the tipping point for Andrew. I don't know if it was video games or a YouTube rabbit hole. Um, he had a deep interest in military history. My family, I'm, I'm fourth generation Navy veteran, has a long military history. And so that teed him up to be curious about it. Um, and when you're curious and unguided on the internet, it can bring you to some dark places. Um, and that's my hypothesis of how he got into this. But that was just the beginning. That happened around the age of 11, and my family lived with the dark, slow creep of radicalization for the next seven years. Um, and it pretty much tore us apart. So uh, after Iraq, my dad proceeded to take 13 separate trips to Afghanistan as a contractor, um, leaving us oh, right. with uh, an increasingly dark spiral um, in the house. and. You know, I, the only way I can describe it is like a slow grief. Um, I felt like I was losing my brother more and more every day to something dark and angry that I couldn't explain. Um, I didn't know why he was so angry. I didn't know why he was so isolated. He had a few friends, but didn't want to play sports, didn't want to make small talk. Um, and like I mentioned, my parents are the kind of people that will try everything. Um, that meant psychologists, that meant Knowles outdoor trips in the summers, it meant new schools, it meant everything they could think of, um, but it didn't matter, right? Andrew was in um, those videos that we saw earlier today were the kind of things he'd watched before bed. Um, and in retrospect, it's easy to say, take his phone away, take his computer away. But the tricky thing about all of this is that every step we felt like we took forward to maybe correct something, the further we isolated him from us. Um, and the best instance I can point out of this is when I came home from college one summer to find a swastika flag hanging on the back of his door. 
And at that point, Andrew and I had gotten closer. He had driven out with me to school that year. I felt like maybe we're forming a relationship because even as ugly as it was, as ugly as everything was, I still wanted my brother and I knew I couldn't give up on him even if I really wanted to a lot of the time. But that day when I came home and I saw, this, saw the swastika on the back of the door, um, the sense of vertigo hit me and rage from like the deepest parts of my body. Um, and I tore it off the door and I tried to rip it in half and we ended up getting in a fist fight. It, that was the only physical fight we ever got in. And I left the fight. I was crying. I was shook up. I was scared and angry. And I felt so helpless. And I went back. And this is where the story gets crazy because I felt like I had to apologize. Because he said, You're, you don't respect my beliefs. You don't understand me. And it was this confusing mix of every emotion you can imagine because as much anger and frustration as that flag represented, me doing that only pushed him further away from me. Every time I got angry, every time I argued, I wasn't getting any closer to solving the problem. I was just getting closer and closer to losing him forever. Um, which eventually, um, as you know, we did. Um, the difficult part of the story is that he had changed so much um, by the time he was in Florida. He, a few months before that, had apologized to my parents, which I never thought we'd hear, and had seemed like he was making a marked difference to change the course of his life. He wanted to enlist in the Navy. Um, we joked that we'd be stationed together. Um, and suddenly, I started to feel like I had a brother again. We talked about having families. We talked about the future. I knew that all of the ugliness in him was still there, but I also felt like my brother was coming back. Um, and so when we got the call that he had been shot in Florida, I had no idea what had happened. I thought the guys he was staying with, he met on a camping trip, and we were actually excited that he was there because you know, they were in college, and he said they were cousins, and that they went hiking. And it took about a week of unraveling to figure out that you know, Devin and Jeremy were not cousins. They did not meet on a camping trip. This was not some college hangout. This was a neo-Nazi cell. And the things that I knew my brother was involved with online were very much real and in person, um, which made the whole thing infinitely worse. Because it's one thing to lose a brother and a child. It's another to be hit with this. And then it's another to have the media hound you afterwards looking for sound bites. Um, there was a lot of. I'm very proud of my parents for how they handled this. I'm very proud of their honesty. I'm very proud of the community that surrounded us, even in the wake of all this ugliness, um, because he was a kid, and he was my brother, and he was their son, um, as dark as it could be. And um, the ghost of that continues to haunt me even now. Um, years after his death, I'd get messages from journalists asking if I could identify my brother in different things, things I had never seen before. One was a video of him um, putting up posters on the BU campus, join your local Nazis. They said, is this your brother? It had been three years since his death. And everything came rushing back. Um, another day, and this was the eeriest one, a journalist reached out and said, could you identify your brother's voice? Um, and Jess had mentioned the Azov Battalion. So when Andrew was 16, uh, about 16, he, his online sphere revolved around um, alt-right members or white supremacists in Ukraine. Um, my last name is Ukrainian. I have Ukrainian heritage. And like how uh, Brandon clung to his German heritage, Andrew started to cling to his Ukrainian heritage and then suddenly felt vindicated. But the important thing was the Azov Battalion pumped him up to make him a, almost like a political commentator, the 16-year-old. And they had an interview of him discussing the impending race war and the Zionist plot to take over the world. So this journalist, what he ended up sending me was a 15 minute long interview with my brother discussing all of his beliefs. Um, not something you want to hear on a Tuesday at the gym. But um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that the tendrils of this know no end. It happened before Charlottesville. It happened before January 6th. The term domestic terrorism was not something we mentioned. Um, 
and it was to this day, right, it just keeps compounding. Andrew was omniscient in some ways of the white supremacists in Ukraine, of the white supremacists on the internet, of the militias that are forming. Um, and at the time, what was most frustrating is that no one took it seriously. Um, I spoke to an FBI agent in college that said, oh, it's probably just a phase. We can't do anything unless there's intent. The psychologist he saw said he had defiance disorder, um, but nothing major. Um, and I think the real kick in the gut was after he died and the FBI agent in Tampa reiterated that, oh, it's, it's just a phase. These boys usually grow out of it when they get girlfriends. Um, and at the time, what struck me most was, I wonder what they'd be saying if these weren't a bunch of middle-class white boys. Um, because I couldn't ignore that fact either. Things have changed a lot since then. The rhetoric has changed. We're here. Um, and I'm very grateful for everyone, um, you know, making an effort to make this better. So, thank you. So there are many, many different kinds of victims of these groups. And Tom, tell us a little bit about your trial. Tell us about bringing justice in that case. So we were able to charge four people that were part of this effort to intimidate. Three pled guilty and Caleb Cole went to trial. There were two issues in the trial. The first was the legal defense, which was this is First Amendment speech. And I, I as a prosecutor, felt really good about how that would um, play out at trial. These posters, in my view, clearly were true threats under the law, and, uh, and I felt confident we could prove that. But the second issue in trial was, were these victims going to testify? I mean, we needed their stories in the courtroom to establish that these were true threats, speech that's not protected, but designed to instill terror and fear. I mean, you saw the video from Chris, and his story was one that was shared by all of the recipients of these posters. They were hard stories to hear. And there was one dad who talked about, after receiving this poster, how unsafe he felt. And he talked about some random Sunday morning where he was making pancakes with his young daughter. And suddenly he noticed out of the corner of his eye, a man walk up to the front door. And he dropped what he was doing. He grabbed his daughter and was prepared to tuck her away when he then realized it was an Amazon delivery person. Yeah, they, these victims lived with this fear. Another victim talked about that for the weeks following, she would take a stick to lift the door of her mailbox because she was worried about what would be inside. But the victims did show up. And the courage that they showed to participate was remarkable. To stand up to this man, all of these videos, all of these efforts to intimidate. And the, the great irony of this case was this whole operation that was designed by Adam Waffen. The intention, the purpose, was to shut people up, to intimidate, to silence their voices. Now, one of those posters says, actions have consequences. Be quiet. And the great irony is that trial showed that their effort was a failure. Because they walked into that courtroom, they stood up to that man, and in the face of all of those threats, told their stories. And the jury returned guilty verdicts on all counts. Caleb Cole was sentenced to seven years, which you may think is too short, too long, but it is a guideline sentence in, in our system. And the judge, in particular, emphasized not simply the courage of those victims, but also 
the important role that the press played in exposing Adam Waffen and the need to protect journalists from these efforts and intimidation. You know, I said that the heroes of unmasking Adam Waffen were really the journalists, but the heroes of this prosecution and the trial were really the victims. And for that, I am very grateful. Thank you. We have just a, a very few minutes left. Gus, what other thoughts do you want to leave the audience with about Adam Waffen? Um, I mean, <laughs> I'm no, I mean, I'm no expert. I just made a film and had a, a crash course in, in this dark world. Um, it is amazing how insidious it has become. Um, I think we always used to think of these things as, as kind of fringe phenomenon, um, but they are becoming more and more mainstream. And as I mentioned at the start, I do think there is something slightly rotten with young white men in today's age. It's not to say that there's anything wrong with them, but I do think that there is some kind of identity crisis ongoing. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we're having these national conversations about um, racial justice, about um, equality, um, women's rights, um, LGBTQ rights, um, and I do feel that many of them feel sidelined. I mentioned my nephew, um, we went to see the Barbie movie together actually. <laughs> and, and I was like, so what do you think? And um, he was pissed. He was like, see, I told you it would make the men look stupid. I told you it would make them just look like a bunch of buffoons. It's so sexist against boys. It's always so sexist against boys. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, boys get punished more. The girls get, you know, um, all of the favorable treatment in school. They get all of the favorable treatment in general. I was like, okay, okay, hold up a minute. I understand what you're saying. The men do look kind of ridiculous in this film, but you do understand that it's about empowering girls and you, you do understand that women were sort of subjugated and um, repressed for hundreds of years, right? He was like, yeah, but, and I was like, well, so do you think that there's a way that we can empower young women without alienating young men? And quick as a, as a, as a drop, he was like, no, there's no way. There's always a winner and a loser. So um, I don't know what the solution is. I mean, Emily and I talked about it when, when we were first you know, beginning to work together and we, we thought, how can we reach young men? Because even though I've, I've highlighted that a lot of these boys suffered from similar conditions, um, it is not to say anything disparaging about those conditions. Um, lots of people suffer from ADHD and anxiety, myself included. Um, but um, as I say, I do think there was, you know, something about being an outsider and because these kids now live in a very different realm than the one we did, as I mentioned at the start, it's, a, it's very much a digital realm. Um, it's not so much IRL forward in real life, it's all online and so you can craft a completely different persona online. In the case of a lot of these boys who I think felt disempowered and rejected, they could feel like a strong man. They could feel like they were, you know, part of something big, that they were exposing the real truth because kids are politically savvy today and they understand that things are a bit broken or at least fraught politically. Um, they know enough to know that politicians lie or are hypocrites, so what do we do? Burn it all to the ground, it's all broken. Um, but I don't know if th there can be more, I think maybe there should be more education in schools in terms of kind of uh, involving their peers. Perhaps kids could be taught, you know, to, what to watch out for. You know, as, as Emily mentioned, she approached, uh, you know, an FBI agent, right, who was actually giving a talk on how to, you know, identify the, what sort of signs of potential radicalization. And she went up to him afterwards, he was like, uh, well, um, don't actually know what to suggest to you in, in practice, you know. But, it, you know, if we could encourage more kids to be sort of active bystanders, maybe come forward and explain to their teachers, I'm concerned about my friend, he's talking about Hitler, he's making swastikas in art class, um, you know, and if, I, I don't know, I think more available counselling, I, I, you know, it's, it's hard. I, almost anyone can get swept up in this, but there is, there are particular vulnerabilities and those who are especially vulnerable to 
this kind of messaging. Emily, last word. Um, there's a lot I could say and want to say, and what I wish I could say is how to solve it. Um, I don't know that on a macro level, and I only have some idea on a micro level. Um, on a micro level, what I can say to anyone who might be personally affected by this in their homes is, and as hard as this is, don't give up on them, right? Um, I think the story I told was really to describe on a micro and a macro level how fear and anger pushing back against this doesn't solve anything. It just exacerbates it. So I guess my goal speaking and in any of the work I do or plan to do is to not spread fear or anger or self-righteousness because that's only gonna make this chasm bigger and exacerbate the problem. Um, when Laura and I were talking about this panel, she was asking about the work I do now and I, I don't have a, a group, I don't have a foundation, but I did think of something that I think is important to share and um, I'm pen pals with Brandon Russell. Well, I was before he got his privileges revoked to write from prison, but um, it was very important for me to humanize both of them because at the end of the day, it wasn't out of the question that Andrew was going to be on the other side of one of those guns. Um, and I needed them to be people and not monsters. And I think it's important that we all remember that because they are people, right? These are gonna be someone's brother, kid, sibling, friend, nephew. Um, and the more we make this about us and them, the further we get from solving this problem. Um, the other thing I know for sure, um, after running around this problem in my head for many years, is you can't do this by yourself, right? It takes many people coming together, um, thinking creatively, and bringing people who think very differently, and generally people that you don't agree with, um, to get to the root of it. Um, so I do not have a 12-step a make your kid not a Nazi program, but I can leave you with with those sentiments. Um, and I'm so grateful for all of you that are here, that have spoken to me, that have shared your time and your thoughts, um, because this is the most hope I've had about this problem in, you know, now it's, it's been a part of my life for 14 years. So, thank you. Thank you.